Our scripture today is from the book of Matthew, Matthew 21, verses 23 to 32. Uh, Before we read this, we're going to (coughs) pray. Excuse me. I do invite you to follow along in your pew Bible if, if you'd like, or any Bible you have at home. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your word, which we are about to read together. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy in giving us your word, in showing us how it is you desire us to to live, in showing us how your spirit and activity has taken place in in this world that we live in. Lord, we thank you that that we see your activity, especially in this word, and that you open up our hearts and minds to receive it as you desire us to. We pray also for your mercy to be on the sermon that it too may be used for your glory and yours alone. We thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 21, verse 23 to 32. Hear now God's word. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. They asked, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. And if you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, then he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, We are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who has two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. And the son responded, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing, and he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Jesus then asked, which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please open our eyes. Sometimes pastors ask for super stupid questions, so I'm going to do that. Uh, how many of you have ever closed your eyes? Everyone, right? I mean, it, you got to. It's a physical reflex. We, we blink, we close our eyes all the time uh, for several different reasons. It protects our eyes. If our eyes start to dry, we blink our eyes in order to wet them again. Uh, Anyone here uh, sleep with their eyes open by any chance? No. My, my mom uh, roomed with someone who slept with their eyes open. She said it was the craziest thing to turn over and look, and they're like. Uh, but we close our eyes most often times to go to sleep. <clears throat> but there are also times where we close our eyes, well, we close our eyes involuntarily. It just happens. But we also close our eyes voluntarily. Because we don't want to see something. Now, have you ever watched a scary movie and closed your eyes during it? Yeah? Why? Because you don't want to see it. You don't want, you know, closing your eyes during a scary movie or whenever you don't want to see something is a a great illustration of that old saying, ignorance is bliss. Right? You don't want to know what it looks like. You don't want to know what happened, so I'll close my eyes, and I don't have to know, and it'll make me happier. Closing your eyes, we do so for a lot of things, or we turn our head, or we don't look, because we just don't want to acknowledge it. 
uh, passing a car accident. Honestly, I wish more people would close their eyes because it would make traffic go a lot faster instead of everyone looking. But some people, they don't look because they don't want to know. They don't want to see it. And I get that. But when we open our eyes and we keep them open and we look at everything, there are some beautiful things we're going to see, but there are also some really ugly things we're going to see. And sometimes that's difficult. When we went to Naples, um, we, we, in our trip, we went to Carrara, um, spent like two or three days there, and then from Carrara, two days, from Carrara went to Milan, just spent like a short eight hours or so there. And then from Milan, we went down to um, Lecce, Lecce, and then drove down to Leuca, spent a few days there. And then from Leuca, we went to Naples. Now, Naples is where we spent the bulk of our trip. We spent about six days there in Naples. Um, Naples does not present itself very well at first sight. If you go to Naples, one of the first things you'll notice <coughs> is trash everywhere. Naples is one of the most dirtiest cities I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, there, there's trash bags and cups and um, homelessness is an issue there. So people are given the homeless, you know, like clothes and stuff so that they can wear. But there's an issue with that, which is when they're done wearing them, they just end up in the streets. And you see that all over the place, torn sweatshirts and pants and underwear, just everywhere. There's poop on the sidewalks, pee on the walls. Um, the, the dogs and cats, they run free. Cats especially, dogs, you know, sometimes they just poop wherever they want. And you can smell it. It's everywhere. Not a clean wall in the entire place. In, in at least where we were, in Naples, graffiti everywhere. Just all kinds, of, and some of it was nice, and others of it not so much, and it just looked dirty. I love Naples, my entire heart. Naples is one of the most fascinating, beautiful, gorgeous, wonderfully unique cities I've ever been a part of. And I would encourage you all to, to uh, go. It doesn't present itself very nice at first, but the charm, the people are so nice. The streets, though covered with graffiti, there's something beautiful about them. Something, something odd about being surrounded by trash and graffiti and people still able to say good morning to you with a genuine smile. Something genuine and unique about sitting at a table at a cafe and there's graffiti all around you and being able to honestly enjoy a cup of coffee and, and a paste, paste, paste pastry. Something really unique and wonderful about being in a narrow street surrounded by people and looking up and only seeing a sliver of sky and yet knowing it's still beautiful at, 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 outside. You ever hear of Banksy? Anyone hear of Banksy before? If you haven't, I encourage you to, to look it up. Banksy is a street artist, a graffiti artist. No one knows who he or she is. Their identity has always been kept uh, private. Um, he does have a, or she has a website um, that they're able to contact Banksy in, uh, Twitter, Facebook, one of those social things. Um, but he goes all, he's from, uh, or she again, from in England. They know that for sure. And they travel all around the world making art, graffiti art, um, in all kinds of different places. Uh, one of the most famous pieces, you can look this up online because you should know who Banksy is, um, was that they had made a painting of one of their graffiti um, things and put it in a frame. And they sold it at an auction house. They gave it, donated it to an auction house. An auction house sold it for $5 million. $5 million for Banksy. If Banksy gets put on your property, your property rates, uh, your property value goes up like millions of dollars. Um, and as soon as the gavel hit, because the, guys, because the guy bid on it and bought it for $5 million, Banksy hid a paper shredder inside of the frame and started shredding the picture. The picture, the shredder malfunctioned and only shredded half of it. 
that guy was able to sell that painting for $80 million. Banksy has a lot of influence, but his understanding of art is that it does not belong to one person, but it belongs to everybody. Banksy drew that, paint, painted that. It's in Naples. We got to see it. Didn't look quite like that when we saw it. The pizzeria that it's connected to, which is right here, covered it in glass so that no one else would paint o over it or, or, or just destroy it. There's a little plaque right here that says Banksy. Not sure Banksy would approve of that, but I appreciated the opportunity to see it. Now, if you're not sure what this is of, it's of um, the uh, Ma 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 Madonna. That's, that's the Madonna, Mary. <coughs> In Naples, on so many street corners, is a Catholic church. You don't have to walk far to find a Catholic church. If you don't have the money to go to a museum to see beautiful art, don't worry about it. Stop in a Catholic church. They're open all day long. And the art in there and the, the architecture is beautiful, ancient, beautiful. And their spirituality pervades every single part of, 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 of their culture. Naples is proud of being Catholic. Naples, their the Catholicism is in everything that they do, everything. You see it everywhere, in the way they talk, in their art, in, in their um, knickknacks. There's a sense of spirituality everywhere you, you look. It is Naples. Their um, patron, patron saint is uh, Saint Giorno, right? Is that how you say that? Gennaro, and um, we were there on his, his saint's day. I, it was really crowded. Now, the Madonna, when pictured, oftentimes has a halo above her head. He's got a halo. But inside the halo, he put a pistol. At the end of the pistol is a drop of light pink paint that runs to indicate blood. Naples is known for its violence and its crim 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 criminal act 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 activity. Now, it has gotten better over the years. This is an old painting, um, but it's still there. It's still part of their culture, the violence that they experience, um, the, um, the, the way that they sometimes treat one another. The, there's this uh, power hung, 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 hungriness with, within the uh, city but it's also part of their spirituality. When Banksy looked at Naples, this is what Banksy saw. He saw the spirituality and the violence. He didn't close his eyes to the things he didn't want to see. He saw them both. And he made a beautiful picture that spoke truth. And that every Napoleon, Nap Napoleon, Napolemite, whatever, that they understand this is who we are. We might not like the whole story, but this is who, 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 who we are. And as you see, when you see graffiti, oftentimes it, uh, it's overwhelming. Bright colors covering the things that, that are below it. His painting works with the issues that, 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 that are there. He uses the splotch of paint, the Madonna's legs fade out in, in, into the uh, stucco that was worn and, and old. Uh, this part, which looks nasty, he didn't cover it, but used it because that's who Naples is. He saw the truth, and he didn't turn from it, or she. And it's so powerful. So powerful, in fact, that most people don't do that. And when we look at our scripture today, we'll see that most people don't do that. When Jesus was preaching in the temple courts, the chief priest said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? The, the healing and the teaching and things like that. So Jesus challenges them with another question. But honestly, the question that Jesus challenges them with is a softball question. He says to them, <coughs> I'll ask you one question. And if you answer me, it's always says, if you answer me, not 
if you give the right answer, if, if you get it right. You know, there's nothing like that. Just, just answer me. That's all Jesus wants. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. So he asked about John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist, he said, uh, where, where did John's baptism come from? Was it from heaven or from human origin? Now they discuss. <clears throat> now, at, well, I'll read the discussion first, and then I'll ask you. If we say from heaven, then he'll ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, then we're afraid of the people, for they hold that John was a prophet. Now, based upon their discussion, what do you think is their truth? The, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, did they believe that John's baptism was from heaven or from human or, or origin? What's their truth? What did they really think? They thought that John's baptism was from human origin. That's their truth. How do I know that? Why do I think that? Why I think that is because if we say from heaven, then Jesus will say to us, why didn't you believe? Because they didn't believe. They, they, made, they didn't make fun of John, but they discounted John. They didn't follow John because they didn't think John's baptism was from God. They thought John's baptism was from human or, origin. And they said that. But if we do say what we really believe from human origin, then the people aren't going to like us. They're going to turn against us. We're afraid of the people. Now, what are they afraid of? What are the people going to do to them? Murder them in, 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 in their sleep? No. They're not going to believe the Pharisees anymore. Their power and their authority that they have over the people, the people are going to take away. That's what they're truly afraid of. That their power are, is going to diminish so what does that tell you about what the Pharisees and the Sadducees think about their power? Is it ordained by God or by the people? They just admitted in this argument of theirs that they believe that their power comes from the people. And they don't want that to go away. They like being seen as being influential and powerful and strong, and they don't want the people to think otherwise. In this whole questioning that Jesus gave them, the uh, Pharisees, whether they know it or not, express the truth that they hold people higher than they hold, hold, hold God. And Jesus has been telling that, them that the entire time. So they cop out and they say, I don't know. They don't answer it. And Jesus says, well, then neither will I tell you. Now, I wonder... What would have happened if the Pharisees would have said, we believe that John's baptism had human or, or, or origin, because that's what they really believed. Jesus then would have tell, told them where his power came from, where his authority came from, because Jesus only wanted an answer. And what would that conversation ha have looked look, look like? Would the people... Would the Pharisees and Sadducees then have been able to change if they just would have admitted truth? Truth is such a powerful thing. But truth is the only thing capable of leading to truth. Lies lead to more lies. You say a lie, and if you don't say truth, you've got to cover that up with another lie. In the world that we live in, what is the harshest truth teller that you've ever experienced? I'll tell you what it is. It's our scale. Scale doesn't tell you a lie when you step on it. Why do you step on it? Sometimes you don't. I don't want to know. that so ignorance is bliss thing. Imagine if you stepped on a scale and the scale didn't move and it said it, it, instead it just said you don't want to know. <laughs> but if you step on a scale, you want to know the truth. Why? Because you want opportunity for change. You want to know how you're doing and the only way to know how you're doing is to know the truth of it all. It's that every time you step on a scale, it's a moment of vulnerability because truth 
is vulnerable. It makes us vulnerable. You step on the scale, you see your weight, you ate a few donuts, you know it, and the scale shows it. So what do you do? Well, maybe you change your ways. You go out for an extra run, you eat an extra salad, but truth changes lives. When I first started therapy, my very first ther therapist was very help, help, helpful to me. But he said to me, he said, he, he told me some really hard truth, things I didn't want to hear, things I knew I should do, but I just felt like I didn't have the capacity to. Um, and he said to me this, after telling me these hard truths, he said, and now imagine you're paying me to do this was paying him to hear the hard stuff. Because sometimes it's hard to tell the truth, to let people know what is truly real. Jesus was challenging the Pharisees and Sadducees to look at themselves with both eyes open. Revelation says the same thing. In Revelation, it says this, it says, I would rather you be hot or cold, but you are lukewarm. I'd rather you be able to see the truth of it, whatever that truth is, but you decide not to. Only with truth is there able to be changed. I pray that as Jesus had, had challenged the Pharisees and Sadducees, that we are a bit different from them and able to open up both of our eyes and see clearly the truth. And when we do so, we are going to see things we don't like. But we're also going to see things that surprise us and that we love. When I first got to Naples, all I see, saw was the trash, the homelessness, the pee and the poop. But Christ's love helped me to see with both eyes open that there's true beauty here. Beauty I never knew could exist in such a place. I pray that we're able to see ourselves with both eyes open and to love that through Christ's love because Christ loves us completely. I pray that we're able to see Trinity with, or uh, Trafford with both eyes open, with Trinity also. Both eyes open. To not get stuck with the bad things that we hear about or see all the time, but also to see the good stuff. But not to get held up, hung up on all the good stuff, but to see all of it. Because only then, after seeing truth, can we ever do anything about it. Social media is not much help. Don't rely on it too much. It gets stuck on one view too often. I pray that we're able to see all of it as Christ desires us to, so that then we can act, we can change, and that we can truly, truly love. I leave you with this prayer, this benediction. Be people of joy. Let joy live in your heart and share the joy of Christ with all you meet. Share joy by seeing the good in each other. Share joy by remembering good times and hoping for good times to come. Share joy by praying for our world. And as you go out into the, into the wonder of God's creation, share joy, peace, and hope with those you meet. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Go in peace.